right. <laughs> Welcome to my talk on Poseidon. So apparently we're going to have a Poseidon adventure. <laughs> Hopefully uh, the talk will sink under its own weight. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll see what happens. And speaking of sinking, unfortunately, the story of Poseidon is one of him starting off pretty, uh, pretty eminent, very important. And then eventually uh, he gets, well, watered down. Uh, <laughs> he becomes, unfortunately, less and less as time goes on, which is unfortunate. So what I want you to do is uh, I know we have certain perceptions of gods and goddesses, and I'm going to mention gods and goddesses in association with Poseidon. We have to remember that how we understand these gods and goddesses will change over a period of time. Okay, so you got to be a little bit flexible. So you're going to be hearing about Athena, and you'll be hearing things like, Athena is the daughter of Poseidon? What? <laughs> and they're going, no, that throws it all off. It's like, okay. So what we have to do is we have to go through this in the evolutionary sense, right? So we have to go through it slowly and gradually and see how things change as we go along. Is this making sense, right? Okay, so, okay, of course, Poseidon was the, uh, uh, the, the, the son of Kronos and Rhea. These are the, the titans, right? Um, and, and of course, his... Uh, uh, brothers, uh, Zeus and, and Hera, right? And they divided the uh, um, the world into three parts in the later versions of the story, right? You have, of course, uh, Zeus gets the sky, Poseidon gets the, the sea, and Hades gets the underworld, right? So that's how it kind of, that's how, that's, that's, that's how we understand it today, but that's not necessarily how it really was in the beginning. So to find the origins of Poseidon, we have to delve back, way back when, uh, to the time of the Minoans. Here we go. Now, when it comes to Linear A, the majority of Linear A, which happens to be uh, the writing system of the Minoans, uh, has not been deciphered. However, we can learn aspects of linear A from linear B. And linear B, of course, uh, is connected to the Mycenaeans, who are, who are the Greeks. And from that, we can discern, in many ways, uh, Poseidon uh, and Poseidon as understood by the Minoans and how that changes over a period of time during the Mycenaeans. So it's, it is kind of gradual, right? Now we got to remember that the Minoans are not Indo-Europeans. The Mycenaeans are Indo-Europeans and they are Greeks, right? Uh, they uh, are those who are mentioned, uh, as I said uh, recently, uh, who uh, uh, attacked the towers of Ilium, uh, for the you know in, in the purpose of, of Helen, you know, in space launched a thousand ships. We know the story, right? But of course, um, we go back to the Minoans. We do know a lot about Minoan goddesses. We do, uh, and um, even from the Mycenaeans. And this is not a, a a talk on Minoan goddesses, but just know that there's quite a few of them, and in fact, the majority of the deities worshipped by the Minoans were female, were goddesses. Now, there happens to be every now and then this diminutive uh, god that appears here and there, uh, and you see this in the frescoes, but we do know that even though the Minoans worship many goddesses, there happens to be one god that uh, does have prominence. And this god will eventually become known as Poseidon. So Poseidon goes all the way back to the time of the Minoans. Uh, he was the one powerful male dandy uh, that has some kind 
of significance, right? And uh, he was, however, connected not to just the sea. Uh, this, this by no one Poseidon will be connected to the sky, the realm of the sky, the realm of the earth, which is inclusive of the sea, and the realm of the underworld. So he has a tripartite division of powers. Does this make sense? This is why he gets the title Earth Shaker, right? He's an Earth Shaker, right? So we have, uh, we see this, uh, and of course, the word Earth Shaker uh, will become a uh, linear B in the Mice of N uh, writing. It will be I, I, na, si, da, one, right? And of course, the da uh, is the part that's da, which is the earth, right? So this is the NAC Dione, right? The one who is the, the uh, shaker of the earth. There you have it. So we, we understand it. it's, it's interesting because you're going to see these kinds of ideas uh, within goddesses, right? So many goddesses will have a sky, a, you know, a earth and an underworld aspect. But going back to this time, you're going to see this in connection to gods, right? Okay, so we take a look uh, and we realize that um, uh, within the iconography, uh, it appears that the sky aspect in general and then related to Poseidon, uh, that the images that are often shown are of the sun and moon. So you have images of the sun and moon, right? When it comes to connections with the earth, that is the bull, you know? So you have the idea of the bull, B-U-L-L, -L, right? So uh, that's connected there, right? So, and the earth will then extend to, uh, extend to uh, the realm of the underworld, okay? So it is a fascinating idea, right? And I, I'm reminded that uh, uh, later on when it comes to goddesses, you're gonna have, uh, you know, she who is above the earth, she is Selene, uh, when within it, she is Artemis, when below it, she is Persephone, right? So you have this there. But we have to understand again the tripart division, the vision of Poseidon um, uh, is, is apparent. Now let's go a little bit further. It is interesting that in archaeology, we take a look at various temples, and temples from the Minoan period. Some of them have also a tripartite division that may reflect uh, worship of Poseidon uh, in these holy places. So you're going to see, uh, you know, uh, three different rooms: uh, the underworld, uh, as represented by the color red; the earth, as represented by uh, the color yellow, you know, yellow or okra. And the heavens as represented uh, by uh, the color blue, right? So we see this even uh, represented in the frescoes at Knossos, right? And we see around them rows of, of sacral horns uh, along the cornices and two pairs of sacral horns inside each cell, cella. And we think, well, maybe that's connected uh, to the bull. The bull, again, is very prominent uh, within. Uh, uh, my known iconography. Sometimes we find that there that they'll have a bull's head, like a kenosis, right, and there'll be the disc of the sun that is placed upon uh, its forehead. Okay, so okay, so we'll go a little bit further, right? Um, one interesting image that I want to talk about. Uh, is a clay seal that was discovered at uh, Kaidonia. This, this clay seal, it shows, uh, this Minoan seal shows uh, a god with a prominent staff in his hand, and he is situated on the top of a tower. Um, 
that maybe is possibly a power of a temple. Uh, it is positioned over this interesting cityscape. And in this image, there are waves that appear to be crashing against it and the city itself. Um, and you know, at the lower part of the tower, uh, and uh, what looks like possibly city gates. Now, there's lots of interpretations of what this could mean. Uh, many scholars would say that as opposed to waves just hitting this tower and uh, you know this city, or you know, you know in a calm way, that this is a tsunami. Right, that this these are mighty waves, and that these waves are being destructive, and they will refer to this as a representation, possibly, uh, of the destruction of the Minoan civilization with the eruption of Thera. You have this huge eruption in which much of the Minoan civilization is destroyed, which allows for the Mycenaeans to arrive. So. Uh, a few will say that this is a depiction of this. Others will say, well, it still shows uh, Poseidon uh, in a powerful position in connection to the land and the sea. In fact, he is standing on the tower in a, in a position where it looks like he's connected to the sky. And then, of course, you have the sea around it. So there's still, again, a sky aspect uh, to Poseidon. Well, good news in certain ways, those ideas, this is how we trace ideas. The formation of this god, Poseidon, in imagery, even though we did not have the writing linear A, this imagery translates over into the Mycen Mycenaean period, where we can read linear B. So there is this transformation and so much of what we learn about the Minoans, we do gain from the Mycenaeans because the Mycenaeans for a period of time carry on some of the legacies of Poseidon to their time. Okay, so there's a sense of continuation. So that's, so, but the bull is important. The bull is important in all ways. So the bull represents Poseidon. And it's kind of implanted in your head. The bull uh, is connected to Poseidon in connection uh, to the realm of the earth. And so what are you going to sacrifice to Poseidon? You're going to sacrifice bulls, <laughs> uh, both black and white bulls. So we'll learn more about this in detail when we get to the Mycenaeans. But let's talk more, more about the Minoans, right? We talked about the bull aspect. Uh, we got re to remember that in... According, to, when we take a look at the frescoes, we realize that an important event for the Minoans is something that's called bull jumping, you know, the jumping over a bull. Uh, so uh, we see, you know, so pretty interesting. So basically, maybe uh, you have uh, a male or female uh, an athlete, possibly uh, an acrobat, maybe, uh, who will run towards a bull. I don't know why anybody wants to do that. Grab the bull by the horns and flip their body over the bull and land on their feet on the other side. Uh, it seems to be a very strange action to do. Uh, I double dare you to, <laughs> to jump over the bull. Now, that's a lot of bull. <laughs> well, maybe so, but there it is, right? And so uh, maybe, uh, you know, you have course, this is a ritual that's connected to also Poseidon, right? Maybe it was an ordeal, a rite of passage for young Minoan uh, girls as well as boys, maybe, you know, and you had to undergo through this because of initiation. We're not so sure, but um, um, there seems to be dancing about these bulls. So it, Interesting because uh, there there seems also to be also be this, this idea of bull fighting, and uh, it's a ritualistic sense. Uh, one thinks about uh, the uh, the Spanish bull fighting, right? Uh, for instance, um, you know, and um, you know, people say, well, this is maybe a, a theater of cruelty, but again, from their perspective, 
it seemed to be done, uh, even if it's for sports, in a ritualistic way, and maybe perhaps a serious way. Well, a remnant of Poseidon in connection to the bull uh, moves down through Greek mythology uh, from the period of the Minoans, and we can detect that, and we're going to go there right now. So, what happens is as follows. Uh, a remnant of the Minoan bull story related to Poseidon uh, is found in the story of uh, Pasiphae, uh, P-A-S-I-P-H-A-E, Pasiphae, right? Or, of course, uh, is that uh, she mates with a, a white bull and gives birth to the Minotaur. Okay, so here's the story. I'll just tell you a little bit a more dragged out version of it, right? Uh, so what happens is, is the story goes, is that uh, Libya had by Poseidon two sons. One, his name was Belos, and the other is Agenor. Now, uh, Belos went on to reign over the, the Egyptians, but, but uh, Agenor, he went to Phoenicia. And he married a certain uh, Telepasa. And uh, as a result, uh, he begat a daughter known as Europa. Now, you got to remember already, okay, already at this point, uh, you have Poseidon uh, in her lineage. Now, what happens is they have, um, um, as we go along here, uh, and they have three sons, Cadmus, Phoenix, and Helix. But some say, uh, you know, what happens is, is that uh, the story goes, and I'm going to say this, Zeus, we know the story was Zeus, right? That Zeus loved her and turned himself into a tame bull. And then he mounted her on his back and conveyed her through the sea to the island of Crete. There Zeus bedded with her, and she bore Minos, uh, Seraphadon, and Rhodamethus. Now, I want to say something. Like, well, Dr. Reichelt, you just mentioned this is Zeus. It's not Poseidon, so it's Zeus with Europa. Ah, but originally, it wasn't Zeus. Originally, it was Poseidon. Oh, it gets more interesting. We'll go into uh, reasons of that in a little bit. So we'll go there. Okay, so so now let's go back. Uh, we have uh, there Zeus bed with her, and she bore Venus, Seraphidim, and Rhapsodontus, right? Now, the very fact uh, that uh, Zeus takes Europa back to Crete which Crete, of course, is the center of the Minoan civilization, uh, is an echo of an earlier idea. And as I said, it was not Poseidon. i sorry, it was not Zeus, but it was Poseidon. But they replaced it by the sky god a little bit later. So let's go a little bit further than this. Okay, so now what happens is, okay, Europa is now on Crete. And, you know, and she has sons. <laughs> right? She's got three sons that are betrothed by Zeus, who's really Poseidon. Uh, and so what happens is, is that uh, Europa meets Asterius. And Asterius uh, falls in love with her, with her, with her, and uh, agrees to bring up her children. Now, when they, uh, these children uh, grow up, so basically the uh, my Minos uh, Sarpedon uh, and Rapsamonthus, when they grow up, they start to quarrel amongst each other. Uh, they love, these three sons loved a boy by the name of Miletus, who's the son of Apollo by Aria. Uh, and as what happens is that Minos, Minos, right? We get the word Minoan for Minos, right? Minos went to war uh, and basically beat off uh, his his uh, his brothers, but uh, what will happen is uh, Miletus also is scared away. Uh, Miletus uh, from the realm of uh, 
uh, of, of uh, Crete, lands in Caria and found the city there called Miletus after himself. Now, I, what's interesting about this is that uh, it turns out that Miletus, on the coastline of Ionia, of Asia Minor, was, was settled by the Minoans. So we're talking about a reflection of the idea of the Minoans through the story going from Crete and settling on the coast of Asia Minor. Now, what happens also uh, is that uh, Seraphidon, we talked about that other brother, right? Uh, he went to the war against the Lycians and he becomes king of Lycia. And against the Lycians are also oftentimes connected uh, with the Minoan, Minoans, as well as the Parians. So we have this, you know, this connection, right? So that you have, in a sense, reflected through this mythology, Minos, uh, who will win the day uh, as, of the three brothers in, in, in Crete, uh, you're going to have a reference in a sense to the settlement or the expansion of the Minoans uh, to the uh, western and southern coast of Asia Minor. Well, Minos now is in Crete, and he passed various laws, and he falls in love. Who does he fall in love with? Uh, her name is uh, um, Pasipe, the daughter of the sun, as well as, uh, you know, and so what happens is that uh, he falls in love with her. Okay, so uh, meanwhile, uh, Asterius uh, dies childless, and so who's going to be the king of Crete? The king of Crete. Well, Minos wants to be king of Crete, right? Because, you know, dad died, so Minos should be the next one, and he wants to reign. But his claim was opposed. So he alleged that he received the kingdom from the gods. And as proof of that, um, he prayed for the gods to support him. Well, so he sacrificed to guess who? The god Poseidon, right? He prayed uh, that uh, a bull might appear from the depths uh, and that he would take this bull and sacrifice the bull when it appeared. So Poseidon listened. And so Poseidon then brings a bull. This bull emerges from the depths of the sea. And King Minos goes, look, this is validation. I am to be the ruler of Crete. And once again, the name Minos uh, is connected to the word Minoans. And this is connected uh, to the Minoan stories, uh, obviously changed and filtered through as a result of, you know, telling uh, uh, the, the, a telephone, right? Somebody says a story. And then, tell, you know, they, they whisper a story, tell us another person, another, another person, and so forth. So the story is going to change as time goes on. But you still have this idea, right? Well, so, uh, but what he does, what Minos does, he just thinks this, this bull is just too beautiful to sacrifice. So he doesn't want to sacrifice Poseidon's bull, even though he promised to do so. Well. So he finds another bull to, to, to sacrifice instead, supposedly being Poseidon's bull, and he puts Poseidon's bull amongst his own herds. And as a result of, of this showing, this evidence, uh, he obtains dominion of the sea and he extends his rule over almost all of the islands. So we have now supposedly the expansion of the Minoans. As blessed, by, uh, uh, by Poseidon. But guess what? Poseidon's pretty angry. Uh, you know, he didn't sacrifice the bull. He didn't listen. And so um, what Poseidon did uh, is he made uh, this animal, this bull, savage and mean. But he did something else that's rather strange. He convinced he, he put within uh, Minos's wife the desire, the pacifier, the desire to have a passion 
for this bull. She falls in love with this bull that was brought from the depths uh, by Poseidon. She falls in love and she wants to mate with this bull as opposed to, you know, her husband Minos, right? And so she finds an architect by the name of Daedalus and um, he had been banished from Athens for murder, you know, so it's reputable. Oh, and um, he has him construct a wooden cow, a cow made out of wood on wheels, a cow on wheels, a wooden cow on wheels. I just got to let that sink in for a little bit, right? And it was all hollowed out, but it had real uh, cow skin around it, right? And then he made it so that she could go inside the bowl and be in the proper position. And then this bowl, sorry, 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 within the cow, sorry. So made it so that she could go into this cow and in the proper position. And so this wooden cow is then wheeled out into the field uh, before uh, the bull uh, of Poseidon. The bull of Poseidon uh, is full of desire uh, and mounts upon the wooden cow, right? And as a result, she's impregnated by the bull. You know, it's a bunch of bull, right? <laughs> uh, and gave birth to Asterius. Now you're going to Asterius. Hey, isn't that the, the name of the, the the Prince of Crete, right? To who married Europa, you know, uh, Minos's mother and her mother-in-law, right? You know, but yeah, that's true. But it, it, it's just repetition, you know, it's had the same name twice. He gave birth to Asterius, who is also known as the Minotaur. The Minotaur. Of course, the word Minotaur is a combination between Minos. Uh, which means, of course, obviously, and Taurus, which means bull. So this is bull of Minos. Now, this offspring, he had a face of a bull, but the rest of him, he was human. And, of course, in compliance with the oracle, because Minos is, is he's panicking here. He's not sure what exactly to do, uh, what his wife did, uh, and this resulting you know, half, well, human, half bull. Uh, so what happens is uh, he consults an oracle and the oracle uh, tells him to shut up this bull man, this minotaur, uh, and put him within what's called a labyrinth. Uh, now, of course, the labyrinth that is created, uh, once again, uh, the architect, a uh, data list, is asked to help design it. Uh, and it was a chamber uh, that with it has tangled windings, perplexing the outward way. So it's just it's a labyrinth, right? You know, we'll go to the labyrinth word in a few minutes. So, so, so you're having these early stories, right? And once again, you can see very clearly that uh, Poseidon uh, is associated in the minds of the the Mycenaeans, and of course later on the ancient Greeks, uh, with uh, the uh, Minoan civilization. Right, so my own civilization of Poseidon, we'll see more evidence. And one of the biggest ones, obviously, is the story of Atlantis. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Atlantis, though it's of interest to many of you here. But uh, uh, many scholars will connect the, the stories of Atlantis with, uh, the, uh, with the Minoan civilization. And of course, the subsequent fall, because they both fall under the sense there's still there's a disaster, and they go under the ways of the sea, and they they both do that. Now, so let's go there. Well, uh, the story, interesting enough, is Atlantis is associated very strongly with again Poseidon. Poseidon is very important, central uh, to any story that's connected to. The lost subcontinent of, of Atlantis. So um, it's, it's first mentioned in Plato's Emmaus. You know, Plato talks about it. He talks about how uh, this power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, for in those days, the Atlantic was navigatable. 
And there was an island situated in front of the straits, uh, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. I'm reading him. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together and was the way to other islands. And from these, you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent, which surrounds the true ocean. So uh, he says it's a wonderful empire. Uh, in fact, he mentions the fact that uh, Atlantis uh, subjugated, specifically, this is, you have to remember this, uh, North Africa, and he specifically mentions Libya. Libya will come up over and over again in connection to Poseidon, uh, and you're going to see this in a little bit, um, but it says that the, the civilization, the Atlantis civilization, dominated Libya, so much of, of course, that's in, in connection to North Africa, specifically uh, next to Egypt, right? It also mentions the fact that uh, this Atlantis uh, also goes to the area known as Tyrrhenia. Uh, Tyrrhenia, uh, that would be uh, uh, um, uh, Corsica, Sardinia, uh, and the western coast of Italy. So Atlantis then has much of the western Mediterranean as part of their domain, or possibly even further. There's lots of views on this. I mean, quite a few. Uh, Plato and his Critias will expand upon this story. Uh, as for the position of Atlantis, some people hold uh, that it, uh, in general, it was northwest uh, of Egypt all the way to Spain, as I just described it. Some people say that, no, it was northeast of Egypt, and it went uh, north to south to the Black Sea. Others will say it's around Gibraltar. You know, others will say that it's Northwest Africa. You can see that with the Libya reference, right? A few will say it's Atlantic Ocean, the Western section. Others will say it's the Northern section. People will say it's America. And other people say it's Antarctica. <laughs> Nobody seems to agree, but it's all there, right? Well, according to Plato's Critias, once again, he will repeat much of the same information about the position of Atlantis. So we have Atlantis in two different sources of Plato, not just one. Uh, and it's referred back to that Solon, the lawgiver, was the first to hear about the story as he was visiting the Egyptians. Uh, he, he went amongst the Egyptian uh, priests and scribes and was asking about the mysteries, and that's where the revelation of Atlantis came about. Okay, so um, what happened is this, is that uh, they talk about the fact that the world is distributed amongst the gods. And for his allotment, Poseidon, was given Atlantis, uh, and he begat uh, children from a mortal woman. Uh, in fact, the story goes is that, uh, uh, well, what happens is, is that uh, he does make this area uh, fertile uh, with his powers. Well, let's go a little bit further. Um, once upon a, a time, we'll go here a little bit more, there was a primeval man of the country. His name is Evanor and his wife named Lysippa, and they had an only daughter that was known as Cleto. Uh, when uh, the, uh, the maiden had reached the right age, Poseidon fell in love with her and had relations with her. And uh, what will happen then is obviously she's gonna get pregnant, but what he does is that he breaks the ground and encloses a hill around her. So he made the domain of his beloved at the center, and then he, he creates this mound, this artificial mound that circles around uh, this, uh, uh, this place, this, which will become the main palace where they live. And then what he does is he makes, uh, strange, strangely enough, uh, he who is apparently uh, a sky as well as a sea, as well as a land god, what he does is he uh, circles that domain of where the palace and the city is to be with uh, a canal of water. And then there's land after that. And then what he does is he cuts then another canal of water and circles around. And then after that, more land. 
So you have, in a sense, uh, concentric circles, uh, and it's every other, it's land, water, land, water, and there you have it, right? So the center island, he brings up two springs, uh, one with warm water, the other cold water. So you got hot, hot and cold, honey water <laughs> uh, in the springs that are in the center uh, mountainous section. So you have this mountain circle in it, you have a, a city there, and obviously you have the palace. And then she becomes pregnant, as I mentioned, and begets five pairs of twin male children. And then what he does is he makes the oldest of the pairs uh, the, the main king, and then he divides Atlantis into ten portions, uh, and with the other kings, or I should say, like princes, in charge of each one. And once again, uh, it mentions that this kingdom spreads all the way uh, to to Egypt. Okay, so uh, there are, much of this land has precious minerals and deposits, and one is called uh, Ori Calcium. Uh, is like the supposed metal of an orange golden alloy. Uh, it's kind of brass like. Uh, maybe it's um, some people have lots of theories on this. Uh, there was a shipwreck, Roman shipwreck found in 2015 uh, near, near Sicily that supposedly had some of this ore. And it's, it's basically 80% copper, 50% uh, zinc, and then nickel, uh, lead, and iron. But uh, it was believed, according to uh, Pliny the Younger, I mean, the minds were exhausted, uh, but the, the elder, excuse me, Pliny the Elder, but it was believed that this was, this, 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 this metal is magical. Uh, you have to use, uh, you know, in order to make it create it, uh, need some kind of alchemy. So you're going to have this magical connection, uh, connect, you know, in relation to the Atlantis civilization. Okay, so moving right along, as I said, there was a palace in the interior of the citadel, uh, and it was it was constructed with a, a temple dedicated to Plato and a temple dedicated to Poseidon. Uh, but this it was it remained inaccessible, except uh, it was separated with a, uh, a wall of gold. But there's an interesting ritual I want to bring up. Uh, Poseidon's own temple, which was a stadium in length, you know, and a half a stadium in width was very tall and it was described as having a very strange uh, barbaric appearance what happens is that the outside was uh, pinnacles were covered with gold as well as silver the interior was roofed in ivory and um and there was an image of the god himself and he was standing uh in a chariot and he is in a sense a charioteer of six winged horses and it was huge in fact it was so big it supposedly touched the roof of the building it also showed uh this, this depiction had a hundred nereids riding dolphins and so of course according to this story supposedly uh, Poseidon's already connected uh, to horses and he's already connected uh to dolphins right so, as you can understand this, is that the very center to the mythology of Atlantis is Poseidon, right? Well, one last story about Atlantis and Poseidon. That, uh, Atlantis was governed by uh, various laws set by Poseidon himself. These laws uh, were inscribed by the first kings on uh, a mighty pillar made of ori calcium, which we just talked about, which was situated in the very middle of the, of the island uh, at the Temple of Poseidon. And what happened is, is that every fifth and then sixth day, altern I'm sorry, every, I'm sorry, every fifth and sixth year, sorry, alternatively, uh, because they wanted to make sure they respected odd and even numbers. So, so after five years and then every six years, all the all the kings would gather together here and they consult about their common interests. Now, on top of this, there were bulls. Hey, here we get the bulls. There were bulls. Now, these bulls uh, had 
free range of the temple. So you got these bulls moving about the temple, right? And, the, and these bulls are connected directly to Poseidon. So the 10 kings, every five and then six years, are brought into the temple and they're left alone. And they offer a prayers to the gods, specifically to Poseidon. They pray that they may capture a victim, a bull, that is acceptable to Poseidon to be sacrificed. So in this ritual, they hunted the bull. They had to hunt the bull, get this, without weapons, but with staves and nooses. They had to rope it. There's aspects of this that happens to remind me of bullfighting. Do you see it, right? And the bull was then caught, led up to the pillar, had its throat obviously cut, and then the blood then fell upon the sacred inscription, right? So there you have it. And then, uh, so you have the bull conception. Pretty amazing stuff, right? So you can see, uh, you know, whatever the origin, some people will say they haven't met the civilization, uh, didn't exist, it's pure mythology. Some other people say it's the Minoans. Uh, certainly, uh, there's lots of ways of looking at this. Uh, some people say, well, we know for a fact, look at the Minoan civilization, the Minoans, uh, by evidence of archaeology, their domains stretched not only in the area of the Greek islands, not only the coast of, of, of Asia Minor, the Ionian coast, which is now known as Turkey, not only along the Black Sea, but we can trace Minoan artifacts all the way into Libya. The Minoans, we know, got to Libya. We also find artifacts of the Minoans in Sicily, southern Italy, Corsica, Sardinia. We find their, their uh, evidence of them all the way to the Straits of uh, Gibraltar. Maybe, the, maybe it's the Straits of Hercules, right? We find it uh, there uh, in Cadiz and other places. We find Minoan pottery all the way out to the Canary Islands. So we know the Minoans were there. So maybe we know they were in the western uh, part of the Mediterranean. So that's a possibility. Or some other people will say, well, maybe they were neighbors of the Minoans. Of course, you have these strange dates thrown by Plato 9,000 years earlier, which is very, very highly doubtful. But there you have it. Okay. But whatever it is, some of the main features of Poseidon are, are in these stories, right? You have this idea that, uh, you know, he is associated with the sacrifice of the bulls. You know, we have, he is connected uh, to, to dolphins, right? You have that. And uh, at this point, uh, he is a god of the sea, but he's also a god of the sky and god of the underworld. And this idea of tripartite division takes a long time to wear off. It's going to be a long journey to go through this page. Okay, well, we find also images of the uh, double axe. Uh, the double axe, um, we find them in the hands of both Poseidon and Zeus. We find it, of, of course, a double axe within the Minoan context. It's sometimes painted over, guess what, a bull's head. Uh, it has been theorized that maybe the double axe was used to slaughter bulls. It's interesting because uh, uh, the Hittite weather god, uh, Teshub, right, uh, is depicted with a lightning bolt uh, in one hand and a double axe in the other. It kind of combines the aspects of Zeus and Poseidon uh, together. There is a certain Zeus known as Zeus Lambrandius. Zeus Lambrandius uh, is from uh, the Zeus is connected to Labrandia, which is an area. Uh, and this Zeus uh, carried a sacred lotus tip scepter. And we know, of course, the word um, uh, Labrandius is connected to the word uh, Labris, which is the word for double X. It's the word for double X. But it's interesting because that same root, Labra, right, is the same root as the word labyrinth. 
So you got this double axe that's connected to the bull, which of course is connected to Poseidon. But, uh, and then of course, this double axe is connected also to the concept of a labyrinth. And we can go different places on this, but you gotta realize that what's gonna happen often is that Poseidon will be replaced by Zeus when Poseidon is no longer associated with the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sky above, he's going to lose uh, that connection. Uh, and, um, and as a result, uh, he will be demoted. But at this point, he's still holding all these areas. Okay, now let's go into, we're slowly moving in to the Mycenaean perspectives but it still has echoes of the Minoans, so we're moving into this period of time. And well, let's look at the word Poseidon. Poseidon. Well, the word posis, <clears throat> the word posis, uh, we get the word um, uh, potis, right? Uh, and it can mean, uh, it can mean a spouse, the one that gives a, uh, you know, the, starts things going, right? And so that's the word pots. What about the other part? What about the Iden part? Let's go there just for a few moments. So here we go. More etymology, right? Okay, so okay, so as I said, posis can mean spouse or husband. The second part, so we have pos Iden. Where does the Iden come from? Well, it turns out that there is a mountain in the middle of Crete known as Mount Ida. Mount Ida. It's sacred uh, to the Minoans. It's really important. It is, of course, uh, to them. In fact, we find sanctuaries uh, along the perimeter of Mount Ida that go back uh, into prehistory. Uh, special knowledge was supposed to be gained from the caves uh, that skirt uh, this mighty Mount Ida. And uh, but so, so there is an association. It means spouse of Ida, the spouse of Ida. What's Ida? You know, we take the word Ida, which does seem to be connected to Mount Ida. But we go a little bit further, further and we realize the word Ida is connected to the word Da. I da ida I da da. So what does da mean? Da means earth. Da means earth. So you have this concept that uh, wait a minute. Well, that means that Mount Ida is Mount Earth, right? Mount Earth. Well, that's interesting. Mount Earth. Let's go a little bit further than that. Well, the word Ida, you got da, again, which means, I mean, it, it means, uh, so you have, sorry, um, you, you got the idea that uh, uh, da means earth. Well, what happens is da will also use a the um, uh, the consonant ga. So you not only have da, but you have ga, and ga, we get the word gaia. Get the word gaia from that. So where are we going with this? Well, that means post Ida, post Ida means spouse, right? Spouse of the earth. It's the it's the earth spouse. Okay? The earth spouse. This is interesting. So Poseidon is the spouse of the earth. Well, who's the spouse of the earth? Well, now we go a little bit further. You got da. And how do you say earth uh, when it comes to Mycenaean? The mater. Da mater. So that means, of course, da mater means earth mother. So post Iden is the spouse of the earth mother. <laughs> and we'll, we'll go a little bit further and we'll see this early on. They will have Poseidon as the husband of Demeter. <laughs> now, are you guys getting the big deal about this? Wait a minute. So, so Poseidon is is the is the, is the husband 
of the earth mother who is Demeter, Demeter, right? And so that's going to be interesting. So let's follow this a little bit further, All right? So now uh, you're going to have uh, many ideas uh, that uh, uh, people get up. People are upset at the supposedly Poseidon because he presided over the Minoan civilization, and now you have this big eruption going on at Thera, and the world changes quickly, right? You have this huge earthquake, and then you have, uh, you know, the darkening of the skies and tsunamis and the, the silent rain of, of ash, and people are, are feeling despair, terror, bad things are happening. And then for three subsequent years, uh, you're going to have uh, problems when it comes to the harvest. We know this uh, even all the way to Egypt. It's a problem. And so many people say this is the beginning of the rocking of the world, uh, Poseidon, and the beginning of, of how he becomes demoted. And so when the Mycenaeans arrive, uh, he's starting to move on the way down from a sky and earth and underworld deity. He's slowly moving to just being an earth in connection to the oceans. So it's gradual. Now, we have now we look at uh, let's talk about um, Poseidon in connection uh, to the Mycenaeans. We have inscriptions from two places, Knossos and Pylos. Uh, at Knossos, uh, we find in Linear B tablets uh, that in the form of various lists. Uh, Poseidon appears by name at Knossos. We have his name, right? Already there, already exists. And it says what's sacrificed to him is an ox, a pig, and a sheep. Well, what? That looks like a demotion to me, right? So he's not doing very well. So when uh, the Mycenaeans arrive at the center of the, the, the Minoan civilization, and one of the pivotal areas happens to be Knossos, uh, Poseidon, uh, they're not giving him bulls anymore. Uh, they're giving him, well, you know, a pig, sheep, and ox, right? We also see in very, very prominent uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, you know, here at Knossos, they say Zeus is very prominent. And we also find references to uh, uh, Mia, which is the mistress, right? Or the mistress. And various references. Uh, we'll have reference to a mistress, uh, Potnia Athena, or mistress of Athens, or Athena. We get the word uh, Athena. You even have a Potnia, a mistress of the labyrinth. Okay, so that's important. Okay, so, but uh, when it comes to to Poseidon. You know, he's mentioned, but at the center, this former center of the Minoan world, he's not as pivotal. Ah, but he's still uh, pivotal in a place, not in the islands, but a place called Pylos, right? At Pylos, which of course is connected to Nestor, right? You know, King Nestor, right? Uh, Pylos, we do have still, we have the remnant. During the Mycenaean time, this is very important, remnant of Poseidon being very pivotal. In fact, we have over 1,000 tablets from Pelos dating from uh, 1300 to 1200 BCE. Uh, of course, um, Zeus is still very powerful. He's very prominent uh, at Pelos too, and he is paired with a god by the name of Hera. Uh, in fact, uh, Zeus and Hera share a sanctuary together. He does seem to be connected to the sky. So already during the Mycenaean period, it looks like slowly, gradually, Zeus has taken over the sky position, which means by default, Poseidon will gain, get to gain the realm of the earth and the realm of the sea and the underworld. And that's exactly what we see the evidence for. So he's just losing his status gradually. We also see that, uh, that Zeus is depicted uh, as a male god, but he's, Zeus is also depicted as a female goddess too. Zeus has two aspects, a male and a female aspect. 
his female aspect is known as the Ouija, right? Ouija, right? Uh, this is, in fact, the Ouija, uh, the Ouija, the Ouija of, of Zeus even receives uh, her own special sanctuary. Wow. Okay. Thus, we also find other gods mentioned like Dionysus. But it does appear that the most prominent god worship Pelos is Poseidon. Yeah, Poseidon, known as Poseidon, right? Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Odysseus describes Nestor making great sacrifices to Poseidon, and the city certainly fits the description. We look at the inscriptions, and we realize quite a bit that Poseidon was here called the Earth Shaker. As I said before, Inisi Deone, right? Inisi Deone, right? The idea is that uh, he is the Earth Shaker. So he has his underworld conception. Hey, you're what he, hey, Dr. Rita, where's Hades? He's not there yet. <laughs> He's not there yet. So uh, he will evolve a little bit later. So at this point, it's Poseidon as he's demoted, is connected to the underworld. In fact, let's go a little bit further. We find that Poseidon was declared as a Wanax. Wanax, what was Wanax mean? Wanax means lord or king in Mycenaean. He's declared as Wanax of the underworld. Poseidon absolutely 100% at this time under the Mycenaeans is an underworld deity, as well as connected to the sea. Now, there was a cult associated with Poseidon, and the uh, cult association was known as the uh, Boso Nihilus, uh, and um, they did various rituals. We have references to what's called the spreading of the bed ritual, the spreading of the bed ritual, the world of the vault, right? There's another one. You know, the cult, we know that there's lots of oil used for libations uh, in connection to this uh, uh, spreading the sheets ritual. Who knows what that means, right? Another celebration at Pelos was called the Festival of Bearing the Throne Around. That's connected. So, but like Zeus, Poseidon was also worshipped in female form at Pelos. It's called uh, Poseidon or Poseja, right? In fact, this female aspect of Poseidon also had a separate sanctuary called the Pikiani, located somewhere in Pilos. In fact, we, we, there are were happen to be 45 slaves specifically belong to this sanctuary. That's amazing. We even find exactly what the author Poseidon at these temples. And I'm going to tell you right now what they are. You're learning a lot here, right? Well, uh, we have we have uh, three, sorry, four lists. Uh, the first list mentions that they offer to Poseidon wheat. Then next they offer wine. And then they offer one bull. So, hey, you know, not offering pigs now. <laughs> They're offering a bull. And then fourth, 10 cheeses, and then fifth, one ram's fleece, and finally sixth, a honey. A second offering lists, again, wheat first, wine second, in this case, two rams, five cheeses, oil, and one ram's fleece. fleece. A third offering lists corn, wine, and two rams. And finally, uh, the fourth offering is corn, wine, five cheeses, uh, and honey. So uh, if you're a vegetarian, <laughs> a fourth offering is for you. <laughs> so if you can't do that, right? So so this is remarkable because we find from this list, right, that, that the offerings follow the tradition of ancient Greece. Because in classical Greece, they always offered the grain offerings first. And take a look. I'm looking at this. And they're offering wheat first, 
or barley first on the list in court, right? And the second, uh, they offer libations. Well, I'm taking a look at this list and wine, wine, right? So let's see here. Wine, wine. Well, we have libations second. So they continue that tradition. Third is the animal sacrifice. And I look on the uh, one, it's one through three, and animal sacrifice is the third. And then, of course, the bloodless offerings following that. So this idea continued all the way uh, into classical Greece and even further. But uh, we know that the, now you know exactly what they offered Poseidon during the Mycenaean period. Are you excited or not? I mean, this is great. Right? Also, we have um, references to Artemis from Pelos as well. And we also find references to the Potnia of the grain, the mistress of the grain, who is Demeter. And Demeter, who is she paired with? Poseidon, of course, right? Poseidon is connected to the underworld. And so through this underworld connection and the earth, he's connected to Poseidon. So this is interesting. Right? In fact, uh, Poseidon uh, uh, talks about the fact that we have some lists here. Uh, list of goods from Pelos reveals that there was a destination for these goods, to the quote, the two queens, the two queens, the two queens, and Poseidon, or and also another two to the two queens and the king. The two queens, most scholars will believe, you know, assert that the two queens, one is Demeter, and the other is uh, her daughter Persephone. Is are we, is this interesting? Right. So already. And you're going to the way that's Poseidon. Why is Poseidon connected to? Oh, we're back to, yeah, he is the still, the conception is he's still the spouse, uh, the husband of the earth. <laughs> okay. Well, this tradition continues. Even though the Mycenaeans, it will end after the fall of the Mycenaeans and the Sea People, the tradition continues on uh, in the area of Arcadia in Greece. It retained the legend, yeah, it, of Demeter as connected to Poseidon. Yep. In fact, they still have a child together known as the mistress. <laughs> Mia, right? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Also, though, uh, so, so story goes uh, as, as follows. According to the tale, uh, Poseidon, uh, in the form of a stallion, uh, pursues the mare, who is Demeter. Uh, of course, obviously, she runs and she hides uh, with the horses uh, that are ranging amongst uh, the king of Oncium. His name is Onikios, and this is in Arcadia. Uh, but uh, even amongst all the horses, you're not going to fool Poseidon. So Demeter's true divinity shows through. And so Poseidon, as the stallion, finds her, catches her, and mounts her. Uh, so we have, fortunately, they have the rape of Poseidon, uh, Poseidon of Demeter, right? Uh, Demeter, so angry, she literally becomes furious. I mean, she, in fact, uh, uh, she becomes Demeter, Eridus, or, you know, Demeter of the Furies. And she wants to have vengeance for her being defiled. Eventually, she calms down, and she bathes herself, and then she becomes Demeter Lausia, or the bathed Demeter. But now she is she is pregnant, and she bears Despoinia. Uh, she bears the mistress. And so you have, again, uh, this story, and it continues. It continued uh, into the time of Greece, all the way uh, to the second century CE. So, yeah, you do have remnants of these early stories that continue on, right? Okay, now we move on uh, to some to be other stories. So I want to make sure we get here. Now, Athena. Let's go there. The mistress Athena. Well, what happens is that Persephone, uh, it was used interchangeably with 
the, uh, the person or the goddess that's early on known as Athena. But this is going to be really complicated. So follow along if you can, right? According to Libyan tradition, we talked about Libya already. The goddess Athena, the goddess Athena was believed to be the daughter of Poseidon and Tritonus. Uh, Tritonus uh, was a goddess nymph of the saltwater lake of Tritonus in Libya, which is in North Africa. And the story goes as follows, is that um, uh, the, 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 uh, the Libyans worshipped a god by the name of Triton, who is the sea god, but they interchanged Triton. I know that's another, that's obviously the, the son of of, of, uh, of, of um, uh, sorry, brain just I, the son, uh, the the, uh, uh, the son of Poseidon. But what will happen is is that um, the long and the short of it is is that eventually, it, you know, before that, so earlier on, it was connected to Poseidon. Now the story goes as follows: It's written by Herodotus uh, that next uh, to those known as the Malekians are the Asians. These and the Malekians dwell around the lake Tritonus, and the river Triton is the boundary between them. Uh, at a yearly festival of Athena, their maidens take their stand in two parties and fight against one another with stones and staves. And they say that in doing so, they are fulfilling the rites handed down by their fathers for the divinity who was sprung from the land, who we call Athena. And those of the maidens who die of the wounds receive what they call false maidens. Now, uh, they have, of course, a procession uh, that moves around, but they believe, they say, I'm still reading the same source, they said, Athena is the daughter of Poseidon and of the lake Tritonus, and that she had some cause of complaint against her father, Poseidon, and therefore gave herself to Zeus. And then Zeus made her his own daughter, such as the story which they tell. What? So in this story, written down by Herodotus, it says that, you know, Athena is born of, of Poseidon, but decides that she's going to disown her father because of a disagreement and claim Zeus instead, right? Well, this is fascinating. Right, and of course, you know, the connection with Libya goes back to whether it be Atlantis or the Minoans. It's still very important, very important women. A lot of people will not gather. Right? Let's go a little bit further. Well, what happens is that um, uh, long and short of it is is that um, you're going to have two traditions that will grow up. That the daughter of Poseidon, uh, Athena is declared as having blue eyes, while that who is connected to Zeus is depicted as having gray eyes. You guys following that? So uh, Pausanias, a description of Greece, says, I saw uh, that the statue of Athena had blue eyes, but the Libyans have a say that the goddess is the daughter of Poseidon, and for this reason has blue eyes like Poseidon. Now, of course, you see also Athena is connected to Triton or the word Triton. And so as a result, here we go. Hold on. Back to the Triton, to the word Triton. So this name Triton uh, appears all over Greece. All over Greece, they name many rivers or wells Triton, right? And um, even in Crete, in Thessaly, Boetia, Arcadia, Egypt, right? Um, and um, the story goes is that, well, hey, wasn't uh, Athena of the Libyans born around Tritonus, around the lake? Yes. So that idea that she's born around that lake, around the body of water, will spread to Greece. And, and so all these places where there happens to be springs or these rivers, people will say, well, you know who's, who, who's born here? Athena is born here. And that spreads because... You know, part of popular knowledge. Well, the problem is, is that the word uh, trite, right? Triton, trite, uh, in, in Cretan, in Aeolic, in Botian, the word trite 
is not just mean spring, it means head. Right? Head. You got you following. And so what will happen is they'll say, so Athena is born from the spring. She is born from the head. And hello, she switched, you know, father. She got rid of Poseidon. I gave you the evidence there. She is acknowledged as gaining or claiming Zeus. And so now being, you know, this ownership aspect starts to morph into a legend where Athena is born out of the head of Zeus. <laughs> there, mystery solved. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> and so you see, you have to follow this, right? Along. Okay. Uh, also, oh, we're going to see that Poseidon will, will eventually be connected uh, to a god by the name of Neptune. Uh, this is, of course, the, the Latin word, Neptunus, which may derive from the Indo European root, a neb, which means wet or damp or clouds. In fact, the word Neptune uh, means he who is moist. <laughs> so um, the Etruscans uh, also have a, a deity known as Nethanus, right, who is the god of the wells. By the way, uh, you're going to a Celtic god of the wells by the name of Necton, because, you know, they're, they're all Indo-Europeans. Okay, so, but what happens now, it's very interesting, is Neptune, in this idea is related to uh, will become related to not just the the you know not just to the idea of moistness, but this Neptune many of its origins connect to the clouds and the sky and the rain. So this Neptunus is connected to rain. But what about Zeus? Well, in this ancient idea, Zeus is connected to when it's daylight. You know, when there's day. And then Neptunus is connected to Zeus will become Jupiter. So Jupiter is a god, deity of the daylight, of the sun. And Neptunus is, is the idea earlier on, he's connected as the god of the clouds, of the rain. And of course, the results of that rain obviously will be, you know, will be water, you know, on the ocean, springs and rivers and so forth. Uh, he's also, uh, this Neptune, uh, Neptunus is connected uh, to uh, this female aspect known as Salicia, uh, which means lustful, desiring sexual intercourse. And so uh, Salicia then represents uh, Neptune's desire for intercourse with the earth. It's this viral aspect that is there. We'll go more into that maybe in a little bit. So you do have uh, these these kind of mixtures, you know, we're back to we're back to uh, Tarhunas of so the Hittites, uh, because Tarhunas is is, is both uh, connected to he's called the god of the heavenly damp or or the heavenly wet uh, as a generator of life, and so he's also known as the Lord of Sky Wet. <laughs> so we're going back that that uh, and of course the Hittites are Indo-Europeans, uh, and so these derivatives, uh, these Indo-European derivatives, go all the way. Uh, to the west. Okay. We also find that Neptune, in this case, is connected uh, to the trident. So this is where this appears. Uh, the the god uh, uh, Poseidon, who now becomes Neptune in the west, uh, the two actually merge together, we know, by 399 BCE, uh, where Neptune and, and, um, and Poseidon are looked at or viewed uh, as one and the same, right? So Let's talk about some aspects. Uh, because I know it's 9.30, but we got started at, at uh, 15 minutes late. <laughs> so we're going to go to 9.45, uh, because otherwise it'll be a shorter talk than you expected. So hope that's okay. So 9.45, we'll, we'll finish. Okay, so here we go. So Poseidon is easily identified by his trident, and he uses it to you know, shatter rocks and, and call forth and subdue storms and shake the earth and other kinds of things, right? Um, he is also clothed in, in a, what's called a pitman uh, or in a cloak, or sometimes he's just depicted nude, you know, right? Um, uh, he is the one that people call upon. 
uh, in danger. He's the one who gathers the clouds and calms the storms, but he's also the one who calls back the storm. So there still is a sky aspect to him uh, in many ways. Um, uh, unlike uh, uh, Zeus, uh, he's not exactly a figure of majestic calm. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, he is as the sea, as the ocean. So, um, you know, the sea can be raging, a uh, tempest, terrible. And so, so of course, Poseidon to have this very um, uh, angry aspect, this wild aspect. And other times the ocean is calm and serene. And so uh, Poseidon will have this aspect as well, you know, so... Whatever the sea is, that he is. So he's extremely emotional uh, uh, as a god, right? Uh, Poseidon, uh, he is, uh, are there many songs dedicated to Poseidon? Now, the Homeric hymn 22 dates from the 600s BCE. And it still kind of shows him as still a uh, earth underwater Sorry, earth god as well as a sea god. So, so he, he loses the sea aspect, but he's still connected in many ways to not only the sea, but the underworld and the earth. And we see this again in Homeric hymn uh, 22, dedicated to Poseidon. And I shall read as follows. I began to sing about Poseidon, the great god, mover of the earth and the fruitless sea, god of the deep, who is also lord of Helicon and Y and Jaya. O oh, shaker of the earth, to be a tamer of horses and the savior of ships. El Poseidon, holder of the earth, dark-haired Lord, O oh, blessed one, be kindly in heart and help those who voyage in ships. So you can see still, there's this other cathodic aspect. But by the time we get to the Orphic hymns, around 200 BCE, it seems that he's, he's becoming more and more connected to just the ocean. So there is an evolution. Here, Poseidon, ruler of the sea profound, whose liquid grasp begirds the solid ground, who at the bottom of the stormy main, dark and deep bosom holdest the watery rain. They, thy awful hand, the brazen trident bears, and sea's utmost bound, thy will reveres. Thee, O I invoke, whose steeds the foam divide, from whose dark locks the briny waters glide. Show voice loud sounding through the roaring deep, drives all its billows in a raging heap. When fiercely riding through the boiling sea, thy hoarse command the trembling waves obey. Earth shaking, dark haired God, the liquid plains, the third division, fate to thee ordains. I mean, this is just, you know, tis. Thine Cerulius Daemon to survey will please the monsters of the ocean play the firm earth and it goes goes on and on earth earth spaces and with prosperous scales waves ships along and swells the spacious sails add gentle peace and fair haired health besides and pour abundance in a blameless tide so there you have it you know so uh, so very much more of the ocean right at that point. We also realize that uh, uh, um, he is very strongly connected uh, to dolphins. We find that in, in Alien, in his work. Uh, so uh, he mentions the fact that uh, uh, the dolphins love or lovers of music, and, uh, and they are his constant uh, uh, companions. In fact, uh, Alien mentions as follows. He said, Lord of the Sea, Poseidon. Of the golden trident, earth shaker, in the swelling brine, around thee, the finny monsters, dolphins are finny monsters in a ring, swim and dance. Yeah, dolphins seem to swim and dance, don't they? With nimble flingings of their feet, leaping lightly, snub nosed hounds. I love that. They call dolphins snub nosed hounds with bristly neck. Swift runners, music-loving dolphins, sea nurslings of nurses, maids divine, and it goes on. So it's interesting. Uh, as, as you know, Poseidon uh, was born, as I said, son of Kronos and Rhea. Uh, we have the story that um, um, 
Uh, Poseidon was swallowed by his father Cronus at birth, but Zeus escaped. Well, guess what? There's another version of the story where not just Zeus escaped, but Poseidon escaped. Uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, he was turned into uh, into a a horse in his place. So while Zeus uh, is a, become is replaced by a stone, uh, Poseidon is replaced by a young horse, uh, of course, and uh, there Cronus swallows that instead. So you still have these early legends where Zeus and Poseidon are still kind of put uh, equally, right? They, uh, Zeus and Poseidon uh, fight the Titans together, right? So uh, Zeus, uh, sorry, so, so Poseidon has this reputation where he just likes to uh, attack the the various giants by throwing islands at them or portions of islands. So we have these stories where he grabs a part of an island and he throws them at these giants and they're plop, they're splat. You know, that's it, right? There you have it. Uh, when it comes to the Palace of Poseidon, is believed to be located in the depths of the sea near Aegea and Euboea. This is where he kept his horses with brazen hoofs and golden manes, right? Uh, and um, we do have a quick story. I'll bring it up. Uh, guess what? You know, remember Poseidon and Athena don't get along very well? Well, remnants of this do go in uh, to the story uh, in relation to Athens, the foundation story, right? So Poseidon enters a contest against Athena over control of Athens. And um, so they're each supposed to give a gift. And Poseidon, what he says that will they'll benefit humanity, Poseidon, he will give the horse. He believes that will benefit humanity. And Athena, he's, she's going to give, is the olive. Well, guess what? They choose the olive over the horse. Uh, and so, well, <laughs> uh, the city of Athens then cho chooses Athena over Poseidon. Ah, well, he gets mad, and according to one story, uh, he floods the place. <laughs> now, the tree uh, connected, uh, the olive, first olive tree, uh, was planted upon the Acropolis uh, area, and supposedly, even though uh, the Persians and others burned it down, uh, saplings grew and continued on there and so forth. Okay. As I mentioned, Poseidon is connected to horses. In fact, uh, it is believed that he taught men the art of managing horses with the bridle. Uh, so uh, there you have that. Uh, many scholars believe that, uh, that Poseidon arrived, some believe this, uh, with the Indo-Europeans uh, and that he was the tamer of horses. He's the one who brought the idea of the domestication of horses to the Indo-Europeans, and, and they spread it to others, uh, and, and then, of course, using the bridle. Who knows? I don't know. But uh, Moving on, uh, you're going to have, uh, when it comes to Poseidon, we talked about the Neptune aspect in Italy. I want to mention that when it came uh, to the worship uh, of, of deity connected uh, to the, the, the waters, uh, the Latins originally worshipped a god the name of Consus, and his underground altar was located in the valley of the Circus Maximus at the foot of the Palatine Hill. But what will happen is, is that uh, Consus will blend with Neptune-Poseidon. Remember Neptune, Neptunus, it's connected to the moisture of the clouds above within the Italian realms, right? But now uh, it's being brought down to the earth, so to speak, uh, with this connection with Consus. And Consus was connected uh, directly to the Earth deity known as Ceres, who, by the way, is Demeter. <laughs> so it is in that sense. Once again, we're back to Poseidon as connected to Demeter. I mean, this, this, these ideas happen over and over again. When we get to the story of the fall of sorry, the story of Troy, I want to say that uh, uh, it is Neb Sorry, it is Poseidon. Uh, who builds the walls of Troy, uh, as asked by King Lomedon. Um, but um, he was supposed to be paid, and he, uh, the king didn't want to pay him. And as a result, uh, he went against the Trojans. And whose side was he on? Obviously, he is on the side of the Greeks as a result of that uh, betrayal. And uh, But unfortunately, 
a guy by the name of Odysseus on his journey home after the sack of Troy. Uh, he blinds Poseidon's son, Polyphemus, you know, the one-eyed uh, Cyclops, right? And as a result, uh, Poseidon uh, moved against uh, uh, Odysseus. By the way, uh, Polyphemus, as I said, was the son of Poseidon uh, through the mother nymph known as Thusa. By the way, the name Thusa derives from the Greek word swift, it refers to the swift currents of the sea, right? If, and Poseidon had many lovers. I want to mention a few. First of all, he had his wife. <laughs> his wife by the name of uh, Amphitrite. Amphitrite, interesting name, the word trite at the end. Kind of remembers the, of the triton idea, the tritonus idea of Libya. Anyway, Amphitrite. And they have three children together. Triton, uh, remember Triton again, Rode and Benseme. So you, again, you have this Triton connection, which is, instead of Triton uh, being another word uh, for Poseidon from the Libya context, right? Now it happens, personifies as a son, but still you have this legacy that goes on, which is amazing, right? Okay, so what happens is that uh, she is known as beautiful, light of foot, um, and uh, they fall in love. Well, actually, he chases her. She finally gives it. This is usually what happens right there. And dolphins are the ones that help uh, convince uh, his soon-to-be wife that just give Poseidon a try. And because of that, Poseidon really loves dolphins, right? Uh, more stories here. Um, as we go along, uh, we have, of course, we have Triton. Uh, Triton, the son of Poseidon, is kind of like his right-hand man. So uh, when the lord of the seas, Poseidon, laid his three-pronged spear and calmed the waves, uh, calling, he called from the deep Triton uh, to uh, bring about order after the great deluge. So, uh, so it was... The combination of father and son that calmed things down. Also, Triton, his son, helped him fight against the giants. Uh, we have, of course, I want to make sure we cover some other of these stories here. Uh, we're almost done. We have also Medusa. One of his lovers uh, was Medusa. Uh, she's one of three sisters. Uh, Steno, Uriel, of course, Medusa. And uh, when, unfortunately, it says, according to Hesiod, right? Poseidon, he of the dark hair, lay with one of these, the Gorgon Medusa, in a soft meadow and among spring flowers. But as we know from Ovid, uh, we see that uh, she Medusa, it said, was violated in Minerva or Athena's shrine by the Lord of the Sea, uh, and uh, which is Poseidon. Zeus's daughter turned away and covered with her shield, her virgin eyes, and then for fitting punishment, transformed Gorgio's lovely hair into loathsome, loathsome snakes. And so uh, Athena, because of the violation of Medusa, you know, by, by, uh, <laughs> uh, by Poseidon, uh, will turn her into uh, this scary snake-like snake hair and turning people into stone. Uh, there you have it. <laughs> so once again, are you seeing this connection or this fight between, between Poseidon and Athena? Or is it just me? <laughs> you never thought you'd make this connection. And now you're in this, you're hearing this lecture and you're realizing this. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Zeus, uh, Zeus uh, Poseidon. Sorry, it's hard to keep the two straight because they're always going into everybody. Poseidon also uh, um, had a relationship with Aphrodite after uh, he kind of defended uh, Ares and Aphrodite after they were caught by Hephaestus, uh, making love. Uh, he defended them. And then, of course, then Poseidon uh, enters into that scene. Uh, so there you have it. There is also stories of, of, of Poseidon falling in love with this, uh, this, this Merites, uh, this handsome man uh, who uh, he, he loved very much. And uh, they, they traveled together. And when all his... Uh, uh, Poseidon moved through the sea, and, this, and there's all these sea animals surrounding him on all sides, and seahorses and, and uh, dolphins. He always had his favorite in front. And of course, unfortunately, Helios, the sun god, got upset by that. 
and transformed uh, his lover into a shell. Well, then, of course, we have um, a few other uh, interesting stories. Um, I mean, he, you know, he was with uh, Amenemi, right? Uh, he was with um, uh, Aeronomi. Uh, he was with Corinus, who turned herself into a crow. He was with uh, Media. Uh, and, uh, and he was also uh, with... Um, <laughs> Uh, with um, uh, uh, excuse me. Well, actually, let's talk, let's talk about the media. We'll, we'll finish. I want to hear this part, and then I'll just kind of wrap things up. Um, according to the story, uh, a pseudo Apollodorus writes that uh, uh, um, Alios married Tripod's daughter, Epimedia, who, however, was in love with Poseidon. She would go down to the sea, gather the waves in her hands and pour the water upon her female member. Poseidon then mated with her and fathered two sons, Othus and Epeotus. Uh, each year, these lads grew two feet in width and six feet in length. Uh, so we have that interesting story. <laughs> so, you know, don't spend too much on time on the beach there. Okay, moving right along. One last thought. We're, we're at the end. Promise, right? I will say that Poseidon Neptune, within a, rep, a, a, a Roman context, was accompanied by the Peridre. The Peridre, uh, these are pairs of spirits or entities who uh, oftentimes accompany uh, various gods and goddesses. For Neptune, these spirits uh, were Cilicia, as I mentioned, and Manilia. Okay, so uh, Cilicia, this spirit that accompanied uh, Poseidon, would impersonate the gushing, overbearing waters. So she was the overpowering waters. So she rep represents that. While Nelia uh, represented the still or quiet waters. And they had various uh, festivals that were connected uh, to these uh, particular spirits, right? Um, and of course, as we sum up, as we close up, I would just say that uh, obviously the sacrifice of bulls were centered, uh, central to the mysteries of Poseidon. Uh, fishermen worshiped Poseidon. There were festivals all over the Greek world. Uh, Corinth was very, uh, very much focused upon the worship of Poseidon as a god. Uh, uh, he was popular in, in that respect. Uh, even uh, there was even a giant statue of Poseidon uh, by the Pharaoh's lighthouse. But uh, what I want to do, I'm closing up now. We're over. I want to say that uh, what we've done is uh, I know it seems very complicated, but I'm glad we're able to work through this because it's very rare. You're not going to hear what you just heard almost anywhere else <laughs> because uh, it is literally a labyrinth of information. But what we're seeing here through the evidence is a gradual de-evolution of Poseidon. He starts off as his as premier uh, deity connected to the sky, connected to the earth and sea, and connected to the underworld. He is the tripartite god of the Minoans. And uh, we see this continuing at first during the time of the Mycenaeans. But gradually, maybe because of the eruption of Thera, maybe not, we're going to see that uh, his sky aspect will be allocated to Zeus. While he will retain uh, the realm as Earthshaker, the realm of the underworld, and the realm of the sea. He's connected to the earth. We also see early on that the mate of Poseidon is the meter. He is the spouse of the earth, of the earth mother. They're together and they have a child and their child is Persephone, right? Or Corn, or the mistress or the maiden. But that this idea is interchangeably connected to Atata or Athena. And so Athena earlier on is connected to this concept, right? 
And this idea of this connection between uh, Poseidon and Demeter continues on in Arcadia. But the connection with Athena continues on in Libya, but still informs, in many ways, ideas related to Greece. Now, we get into the Greek Dark Ages, and things are not going very well for Poseidon. Uh, what will happen is eventually Hades is introduced. When Hades is introduced, he takes over the realm of the underworld. Uh, Zeus is connected to the sky, and by default, he gets stuck with the sea, right? <laughs> That's his area. And so it is. it happens so gradually. I mean, it's so gradual. But um, uh, then he just becomes like this moody god, you know, that, that is, you know, slightly, you know, he's more emotional, less than Zeus, kind of looks like Zeus. Uh, and uh, he's just connected to the ocean. Yet, in many respects, there still is an aspect where he has control of the clouds, uh, even in the form of Neptunus. He still has some kind of sky power uh, when we have uh, the, not he just not, doesn't control the, 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 the waters and the waves, right? He, the tidal forces, he also connects or controls the clouds as they can connect with that. So he is connected still to the watery realms, whether it is on sky or whether it is on earth. But it is a gradual uh, de-evolution uh, that goes all the way back uh, to the time of the Minoans. And I hope you have enjoyed uh, the unpacking of this mystery uh, and have realized that uh, um, uh, when it comes to any kind of religion, even Greco-Roman religions, there is the sense of evolution. It doesn't stay the same. And we always have to respect that. Thank you. All right. There you go. There we go. You heard stuff that you probably would never hear anywhere else. <laughs> You're welcome, Cindy. Yeah. So, and you'll never think of Athena the same again either. <laughs> what? Athena? Connected to what? <laughs> A mistress? Connected to what? Persephone? Connected to, you know, what? You know? And you're going, poor? How is this possible? Well, I'm great having you here, Sonia. Yeah, it just, it just, uh, we go through the evolution, and I took the time, and you know, to make sure that you could follow this gradual evolution. What I didn't mention either was the fact that uh, both Zeus and Poseidon have male and female aspects, even into the Mycenaean period. I find that interesting, too. Thank you, Laurel, for being here. So, yeah. So, yeah. So you have that. Any questions? Nope. See ya. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia, for being here. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you, Sonia. You too. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much for being here. I have a question. Yes. So do you believe that the, the evolution of the demotion of Poseidon was motivated by maybe even a, a subconscious movement towards monotheism, such as the, uh, you know, the focus on Zeus? Or do you think it was maybe a, a cultural demotion to eliminate, you know, previous cultures um, and, and, and maybe even eliminate some of their impact and, and I provide for maybe a re-identification of, of of the religion? Well, it's, it's, it's actually, that's, that's a great question and it's worth unpacking, so we'll unpack it. Okay, so what happens is, is that we do know, we absolutely do know, by the time we get uh, to the pre-Socratic philosophers and we're getting to Socrates or, or you know, to Plato and others, we do know that Zeus is starting to take um, uh, a, a uh, place of kind of like the god that's beyond the gods. So you already have that conception coming about. So there is that move towards a, not maybe kind of like monotheism, but the idea is you have the origin of all things, uh, just kind of like with Brahma, right? It's kind of, like, so it becomes more and more philosophical as time goes on. And so he becomes a god that stands behind the gods. And so 
he becomes, he's inclusive. He becomes inclusive of not just in charge of the sky, but he is in charge. He's the superior uh, God. He is over all the other gods. He is the father of all the gods. And uh, so, uh, so uh, Poseidon uh, and Hades are lesser and they're jealous. In fact, uh, one time uh, Zeus says, you know what I'm going to do? I, I, if he, I'm, I'm tired of Poseidon. I'm going to do something terrible to him. And Poseidon because it's kind of resentful. But Poseidon doesn't have as much power as Zeus as time goes on. So they can't, he can't even challenge him. So there is that aspect of it's easier to have the concept of the God behind the gods to appeal in a philosophical sense. That, uh, and so you're going to have, uh, if you read in Greek, uh, various uh, philosophers who are talking about God. If you take a look, the word that they use for God is just simply Zeus. You know, so you have so this. There is this concept there. There is this sense of, of evolution, but at the same time, at the same time, there are cultural reason, reasons for this too. You're going to have Poseidon. His background goes back to the minorities. It's pretty hard to not say that. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot. There's even more evidence, uh, and it's interesting because we're looking at evidence of the legacies, uh, whether it be in Arcadia or Libya, or in these stories that are told by, by Plato and by Atlantis, or we find the, you know, the iconography and the Minoans that connects to Poseidon that we know if for sure when we go to Linear B are connected to Poseidon. So we know through that legacy that, yeah, you know, have that. But you see, it seems like the Mycenaeans, except for Pelos, are, are not too crazy about uh, Poseidon. And so there is this shift where we're going to move to our Zeus, who our sky god. I mean, think about it. We don't have any conception of a sky god within the Minoan culture, right? You have, I mean, except for the fact, unless he's, he's, you know, only a sky god. We have the idea that he's connected to the sky, he's connected to the earth, and he's connected to the underworld. We have the tripartite division idea, but the idea of this singular sky conception. And in many cases, he's tethered to this idea of post idiom. He is, he is the spouse. He is the husband of the earth, you know, mother, you know, he's, who's they, you know, earth, mater, mother, the mater, which is the meter. Uh, he's the spouse, which seems like he's the guy that just kind of contributes uh, to, to, you know, he's a sperm donor, <laughs> you know, you know to, to the earth. You know, so he has this still this strong connection. Uh, to, to the earth, but he's also connected to the sky. And I think that also we talked about Neptunus, most likely this connection as echoed through Neptunus uh, connects to Poseidon, which is that he's probably connected to not only to the sky during the minor period of time, but he's connected to the clouds above, right? You know, the rain, right? The moisture. Well, here comes the Mycenaeans. Here comes the Indo-Europeans and they bring with them Zeus and 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 it's possible that the Minoans are not happy with Poseidon anyway because hello they worship Poseidon and their civilization was destroyed. <laughs> Poseidon may not have been a very good steward of his dominion, so he's he's downcast already there. So maybe they weren't that excited about him. But what happens is now Zeus goes and he and, he, and, and the Mycenaeans really put Zeus Zeus on a pedestal over Poseidon, and you can see this. At Kenosis, and you see this in the inscriptions uh, in Linear B and other places, but the exception is Pelos for some reason, where Nestor is from. There, it seems that Poseidon is still really important and continues on to have that significance that he had prior to during the time of the Minoans. But with the time of the Sea People, when they hit, what happens then? Well, then at that point, uh, Poseidon sinks a little bit lower. I hope I'm making sense. So you're having cultural shifts that is involved. So you have other cultures uh, that seem to be wanting to demote, or I should say the Indo-Europeans seem to be wanting to demote uh, Poseidon and to shake him out of the sky and, and, and make him just the earth shaker uh, connected to the underworld, as we know from the inscriptions, and connected to the ocean. And then eventually, as we follow this, is more and more uh, he's connected to just the, the sea. It gets really sad. I gotta, let's, go make, let's make this worse. Uh, he get, connects to the sea, but uh, Oceanus is, is then connected to, who's a Titan, who's connected to the encircling sea. 
all around. So Poseidon's like, well, great. So I'm just, I'm just this immediate sea, but not the deeper sea. And we see this earlier on that we know that Poseidon was connected to the the realm of the lower seas, the encircling sea. But now that's given to Oceanus, who he did, um, you know, marry the daughter of Oceanus. Or, so yeah, the granddaughter of Oceanus. This is fascinating. So am I answering your question? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I, I've also seen and been, you know, fascinated about the evolution of Poseidon almost into Christianity. I mean, you talk about the water of life, the the Trinity, the you know, the the the, the Holy Trinity and, and the Trident, and it just seems like there's a direct correlation or an evolution of some sense, obviously not directly, uh, from the Poseidon theory and concept into that that Christianity hold. And it just, it, it's fascinating to see how strong Poseidon, I didn't realize his origins were as a, you know, such a strong figure. And so that, that's just very, very eye-opening. Thank you. Yeah, very strong. And, and, and I want to build on what you just said. Uh, you're going to have this idea of Zeus. In a philosophical sense, he becomes this great god, right? And he's, a, he's still, in a sense, uh, connected to the realms of the heaven, right? So then you're going to have, then of course, you're going to have what do they do? They didn't have an aspect of himself reaches towards the earth, right? So it reaches down to the earth. Uh, and that, of course, uh, will be interpreted in different ways. Uh, by the time you get to uh, uh, to Plato, right, that's the Demiurge. But before that, Heraclitus of Ephesus, it's known as the Lagos, right? So from Zeus. Remember Heraclitus of Ephesus, who lives from the 500 to the 400s BCE, uh, he says that uh, God is Zeus and not Zeus. And so he does give the label, but he says that but the, the Zeus uh, is, uh, uh, when he created the world, uh, he spoke, and that was the word, which we would say in Greek, logos. So you have this aspect of himself that comes from the sky and reaches down uh, to the earth, right? And then you have, eventually, uh, this idea goes into Plato, and it goes into uh, the idea that uh, uh, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, um, uh, the Demiurge. And then it goes into Philo of Alexandria, uh, who's this first century BCE, first century CE, uh, Jewish writer. And, and the idea is that uh, the God, Yahweh, is tripartite. He is, he is the monad, he is the one, uh, and coming from the monad is the, the Logos. And from there, uh, arriving from there, uh, is, what is connected to is immersed within the earth, which is interesting. Now we're going somewhere. And then this idea will go into the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then this idea also connects to the concept of the Holy Spirit, which is connected to, well, hello, the reception of the earth. So you have that which is above, reaching down that which is below, and then the reception of that. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, it's just, it's so intriguing to see how it all ties together. I mean, all, all it, it all kind of bleeds into each other and overlaps and, 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 and touches each other. Thank yes. You. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And of course, the name Zeus, uh, um, uh, you know, goes, goes, goes further back, right? You know, so, so we have, we go back to the Indo-European uh, and the word is deos, deos, and deos uh, is the in, uh, the Proto-Indo-European word for sky, and it was Dias Pitar, you know. So 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 it's Dias means sky, and Pitar means uh, father. So sky father, yeah. So, and then later on, Dias uh, becomes the lower higher part becomes Zeus or uh, Zeus, uh, and the lower part becomes the, the lower ones become the Theos, you know, as a theology, and then this idea of of you know Zeus. Pitter will go to Illyria and then to a uh, the world of the Romans and will be found go from Zeus Pitter to Jupiter. Jupiter, you know? all high father, you know, sky father, which of course we get the word day, right? You know, I'll say the word, uh, remember when we say day in English, right? That has the same root as deos. <laughs> so we're saying day, which means sky. Yeah. And of course, Pitter, Potter, Petner, uh, Vater, father, right? You know, and the same root as Pitter. Mater, a mooter, you know, mother. So, like all these religions have a, a giant Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I've done this. I've done diagrams and how these connections go together. But yeah. So these, so there has to be. I mean, they, you know, humanity. We look at the sky. Well, well, that's one realm. Yep. 
we look at the earth, go, well, in the ocean, well, that's another realm, and go, hey, well, there's something under it, you know? So it's, it's natural for us to divide the world into three parts. Yep. And we're going to see this also in the religion of the Canaanites. The Canaanites will divide the world into three parts too. So each under their own particular God. You know, and of course, the highest God is El. You know, and of course, El is Alam, which we get the word, you know, Alam from. And it's also Israel. <laughs> it just simply means God in the phonetic language. So, same root. So, yeah, but you have this, again, tripartite divisions uh, throughout, the, throughout the world. Uh, and we look again at the, uh, at the partition of the earth, and it seems obvious. Now, there seems to be kind of a flip side. People go sky, sea, earth. Other people go sky, earth, land, and underworld. So you're going to have variations on these themes. And these variations do connect uh, to Poseidon. So Poseidon sometimes uh, seems to be connected to the ocean and the land earth, and then the underworld is separate. And sometimes it's understood that the ocean and the earth is connected to the underworld as one. So, you know, so it just depends on what writer you're talking about. <laughs> any, any other questions? Thank you for Thank taking you. the time to walk through that. Absolutely, Jeff. Um, I have a question. Um, sure. Laurel. Did they uh, worship Poseidon in North Africa apart from in Greek colonies, or did he have a counterpart in the religions there? Yeah, so the answer to the question is in North Africa, in Libya, he's worshipped as Tritonus Triton. And okay. uh, the word Triton, <laughs> that's, that's Libya. He was worshipped as that. And they connected that worship, Triton, with uh, that being Poseidon. So Triton is Poseidon. Later on, it will evolve that, uh, that Triton is not another word uh, for Poseidon. It will evolve that uh, Triton will be the son of Poseidon. The name will, will still be there. It still continues on. So in the, in the Libyan version of North Africa, uh, he is Tritonus. You know, you have, uh, you know, so you have uh, you know, Triton, Tritonus, which is connected to, of course, it's the same name, by the way, uh, as the female aspect. In fact, you take a look at it, you got, um, we go back uh, uh, into to my notes here. So I'm going to go back just for a few seconds. I want to make sure uh, we're here. I'm in front of all you guys. Uh, we're going to talk, right? Uh, I'm going to find it here. Uh, let's have uh, a little Maybe I don't. Oh, okay. Um, what's here? Yeah, um, I'll find it. Give me a few seconds here. Uh, I'm looking at the. I'm looking at Atlantis. That's there, get that there. Labyrinth, double axe, Poseidon, hands, offerings, um, Neptune. Oh, okay. Let's see if I find it. I love it. So what I do is I write these notes, but I also write notes on top of my notes. So it does. You know, my notes are literally a uh, a possible labyrinth. <laughs> uh, imagine you. Media uh, thing. Okay, got it. Libya. Are okay, you ready? Okay, so here it is. Okay, so the names, here we are. Okay, so the names are as follows. Okay, so the name here, okay, so the name is um, uh, uh, tri uh, Tritonus, Tritonus, or it could be just simply Triton. And then the female aspect uh, is Tritonus. Sorry, mixed up the masculine and feminine, I apologize. So Tritonus. And Tritonis. So one is US end and the other is IS end. Or in some cases, they drop the US and it just because it's the Latinization anyway, uh, but they call him Triton, which is the same name. So what you have is a, a masculine, in a sense, Triton and a feminine Triton. Now, you should find that really interesting. And that is connected uh, to Poseidon, you know, Poseidon uh, and his, his wife. North Africa 
which of course we could say tripodics. It's on this, right, sorry. <laughs> so what's interesting about this is remember we went back to Mesonea, remember at Pilos, remember that we had the worship of a masculine form of Poseidon and a feminine form? Well, look, it almost seems like this mirror effect idea uh, discovered in Linear B uh, from the Mycenaean civilization, Helos, having a masculine and a feminine version uh, of Poseidon is, is echoed here when you have the Tritonis, Tritonis, uh, or Triton or Tritonis uh, configuration. And of course, they give birth uh, to Athena. <laughs> <laughs> does, that, does that help? So yes. So if you, for, for for easy reference, uh, Poseidon in North Africa is Triton. Thank you. I don't know. We took a long time asking the questions. I apologize, <laughs> but uh, I had to go with you on the journey. I want to make sure I had to correct myself because I was uh, I was feminizing Triton. Well, of course, then he was feminized, so maybe that's okay. <laughs> he'll, he'll forgive me. Uh, if he's going to my no advice and in route. Uh, any other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a, I have a quick uh, uh, tidbit to share with you. I know you talked about the uh, event that they would partake in, in, in um, where they would flip over the bulls. Yes. So the, the very first uh, history book that I was ever bought when I was uh, when I was eight years old. I don't know if you can see it. Is there is, is, is this guy right here? This is born World of History. Oh yeah, that's great. And uh, early on, you can see they're they're actually demonstrating that right there for there talking about uh, life on Crete. And so I just thought that was so interesting. I remembered that from from my from my youth that as soon as you talked about that, how that was an event that they would partake in to honor the gods. Yeah, and, 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 crazy and, and, to, it, it struck me as as just like you said, just as crazy to run at a bull and grab its horns and try to flip over it. I don't think I, I don't. Yeah, I, I see various images. I'm going. I don't know how they would do it. I would. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at. I'll be honest. I look at the physics, and I'm still not sure how they can do it. I mean, no. because because you, because you run towards a bull, chances are it's gonna it's gonna throw you up. No. So you know, maybe they're 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 lying, and it's actually they're coming from behind. I don't know. The only thing I can think of is modern gymnasts when they land on the uh, the springboard and, and jump over the pummel horse, but yeah, not, not a skill set that I uh, that I own. So. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh no, and, and, and it can imagine also it's, it's not just my own men; it's my own women who are doing yeah. this. Yeah, and remember, my own women are topless, so you can imagine how much pain you're going to feel afterwards. <laughs> Sorry, uh, absolutely, <laughs> no bra. So it's like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hopefully they did something hopefully they did something to make things easier and for the men too right how you gonna you know you know they're wearing kilts <laughs> so, uh, i would not want to be a gymnast or somebody uh, doing something uh, that's related to uh sacred pageantry in, in in that time so yeah. um, i wouldn't want to. there is there also I alluded to something else and that is you notice that reference uh, in supposedly Atlantis, of uh, how they capture the bull. And they seem to be luring it and playing games with it until they're able to ca capture it with a noose. And aspects, I've, I've actually had visited bullfighting uh, when I was in Colombia at one time, I got with the bullfight. And some of what I saw there uh, reminded me of what's described, you know, in, the, in, this, in this story. And I wonder if there's aspects of ancient beliefs and perspectives that are related uh, to bullfighting in Spain. Obviously, the first time uh, recorded that there's a bullfight officially is like under the Visigoths, you know. <laughs> you know, but I know that. But uh, there's, but then again, there seems to be also connections to fighting a bull within uh, the Roman arenas, uh, in, not only in Spain, uh, but also in Italy, and and. Uh, and there's also that connection within the Etruscan civilization. And we can go further back in Anatolia. And I'm thinking, hey, you know, maybe bullfighting is a, because it, it's done in such a reverent way, even though it's, it's I mean, it seems to be, you know, it's, it was an art. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me of, of a Minoan ritual, something I think the Minoans could do. Yep. 
the modern uh, you know perception is obviously brutality, but yeah. uh, they say perception isn't always truth, but it's the reality yeah. we deal with. So it's it's all about your the time frame in which you exist that defines how you perceive an event, an activity, or or words that are spoken. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I thought it was terrible. You know, I had to close my eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I saw it, so I was upset. But you know, and I didn't want to go. I was forced to go. But at the same time, uh, watching what they're doing, there is there is a religious pageantry to a, a bullfighting that uh, seems to be that uh, there is there's got to be something uh, something connected to ancient worship that's in this and uh, may go all the way back uh, we know that the um, uh, the minoans were in spain too so who knows how many routes this idea could go, could, could go. i doubt uh knowing the romans i really 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 doubt that under the visigoths is the first time you're going to have a, a bullfight you know, because uh, I, in fact, I read uh, in in uh, ancient writers, they're talking about bullfights all the time. You know, mm -hmm. one place they mention it quite a bit, uh, which is fascinating, is the center of a lot of bullfighting uh, during Roman times, Africa, or back to Libya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in fact, there seems to be some some something really interesting about Libya. Uh, it, it's a lost connection. We have these legacies connected to the Minoans. And um, I'm hoping that as maybe things get a little easier uh, in Libya, the archeologists and other researchers could do a little bit more work and see see more about what's going on there. It's, it's funny because whenever they mention Atlantis uh, in the two times under, under Plato, they mention, and it gets all the way to Libya. <laughs> they mention Libya by name. It's yeah. like, well, Libya seems to be center. Uh, in according to according to Plato, and then you also think to yourself, um, uh, they mentioned the fact that uh, when they're making this, how big is Atlantis? They say, oh, it's as big as Libya uh, and Asia put together. Asia being Asia Minor, which is in Turkey. So, but uh, and Libya seems to have uh, these early connections to Poseidon, and it seems that I, I know that the Minoan civilization ended to that coastline. That because the Egyptians dominated obviously that part of the coastline, that the Minoans made a strong foothold right uh, to the west of Egypt. It was so it's basically like Egypt and Minoans compared to Carthage and Rome. Right. Exactly. I mean, yeah. yeah. There's this like, there's this balance yeah. going on there. There are stories where uh, we find that the the Egyptians uh, are at odds with those in Libya go all the way back to ancient mythology and so maybe this was a foothold uh, of, of uh, the Minoans of course you say maybe Atlantis well Bill no. I mean well Atlantis is the Minoans and yeah that makes that works for me um, although I'm, I'm trying to figure out some of the other theories <laughs> so uh, uh, because you know I, I, I believe Atlantis is connected directly to the Minoans the Giddy Villa which just reopened has a Minoan artwork showing bull jumping well I got to go see that Oh, that would be great. I want to order which which the picture they'll show. Good job. Any other questions? Did you guys are you guys learning? Is this fun? Oh, a lot of a lot of information, huh? <laughs> Lots of good my head always spins after these things. My brain is going around trying to process how much information you just crammed into two hours. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of mental digestion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like, like I said, some of the themes I want to make sure that we remember uh, is, uh, you know, the cliff notes, uh, is that Poseidon and Demeter were, were the original couple. Yeah, and they had a kid. <laughs> That's Persephone. Uh, that also is core. It's also the mistress. That's also Athena, uh, which is fascinating. And Athena herself folks on Athena. Athena goes through an evolution itself, where she's at first the, the daughter of uh, uh, Poseidon, which is the Zeus, and then goes from the um, it, you know being connected to the um, uh, to the, the waters, being connected to being sprung out of the head of Zeus, which is really strange. Things here. I'm just thinking about how much imagery and lore Poseidon shares with Paul Bunyan. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dorian. Always fun. Yeah. 
Well, you know, you know, you know, you know, Poseidon has a tendency of having, I didn't mention this, he has a tendency of fathering giants. That's his other kind of situation. So there's a lot of stories where, you know, if you if you mate with Poseidon, you're gonna have huge kids. <laughs> and, and, and they're not gonna look very good. Sometimes they're they're all times like big ugly monsters. So be careful. <laughs> Use protection. <laughs> so with Poseidon. Uh, there is a big blue ox. That's true. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're 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 going there. Yeah. So, uh, any other thoughts? No. Okay. Well, there you have it. Uh, so, I will go ahead and um, and um, as I as I see this uh, talk, you know, sinking. Uh, you know, in, in, you know <laughs> slowly like, into the west. <laughs> slowly into the west. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the sunset. Um, I will uh, say, hopefully, the pot did not sink under its own weight. Hopefully, it was a Poseidon adventure, uh, and uh, hopefully that um, I made some waves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, other than that, I will say so long. <laughs> and, uh, farewell. Uh, and um, uh, as the tides turn, I'm off. <laughs>